I'm on a tour of the United of the Eastern United States, thanks to uh, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom providing me a $2,500 grant. Um, and I'm visiting Wilf branches and getting testimonials from people who are actually experiencing the, the mess that's being made in our country by the nuclear industry. Um, I'm co-chair of the nuclear of um, the Disarm and Wars Committee and have been for a number of years. Last year I toured the West Coast and the East Coast with Carol Erner on the Nuclear Free Future Tour. Uh, how many of you know who Carol Erner is? She, she's a wonderful, wonderful woman in her 80s who says she's traveled enough now. Um, but the fold-over flyer that you've got there on, on, your, the, on your table here was drafted by Carol, and she is um, she really understands these issues very well. And I think that what is most convenient for me is to kind of go through this flyer and come up, cover some of these issues with you, the way that she laid it out. Um, but first, I'd like to tell you about where I came from. Um, in 1984, I was working for the um, for the National Wildlife Federation and interviewing homeless people for a play I was writing. And I was going through Lafayette Park in front of the White House and I saw a little old lady um, in a ski suit lying on the sidewalk between two huge signs. One of them said, Mr. President, why don't you come out with the forest homeless? This was when Ronald Reagan was there and he thought, you know, he, didn't, he thought homeless people wanted to be. And the other sign was a huge sign that was a mushroom cloud that said, Revelation, this need not be our end. And ever since I was a kid, I was um, convinced that nuclear weapons were a bad idea. And so I stopped to talk to this woman and uh, found out that they had been there 24 hours a day, day and night, since 1981. And I, and I said, do you do this by yourself? She said, no, I have a friend, he's a philosopher, his name is Thomas. And I came back to meet this man the next day because I needed to flesh out the main character of my play. And sat down and listened to him for about a half an hour and I realized, whoa, I've been dreaming about him ever since I was a child. <laughs> Literally, not just, you know, fancifully, but, and the dreams came rushing back. So, um, three weeks later, I quit my job and joined the vigil, and three weeks after that, we were married in front of the White House, and um, we were married till he died in 2009, and we had quite an adventure. It was an amazing experience. Um, it, we began circulating a petition to the legislators asking them to uh, abolish nuclear weapons in the mid-1980s, and we got hundreds of thousands of signatures from people all over the country and all over, the, particularly all over the world. And uh, I, I was taking them up to Capitol Hill every year, taking a larger and larger stack of them and going around to the offices and saying, will you please introduce this as a bill? And nobody was interested. And then a fellow came to town from um, Arizona who had been involved in the Impeach Governor Meekum campaign where, when they got rid of Governor Meekum because he refused to recognize the Martin Luther King holiday. And he said, what you need is a voter initiative. So we did. We did a voter initiative. We started it in 1990, had to negotiate, and then the first Gulf War started. And nobody wanted to work on a voter initiative. They all wanted to go out and drum, beat on drums day and night for 40 days and 40 nights. So that's what we did. But in 1992, we started again, and in 93, we won the election, much to the surprise of many people. We heard people coming out of the voting booth saying, how could you vote against this? And as a result, Eleanor Holmes Norton, the, Congress, the new congresswoman for D.C., who had before the election said if it, was, if it passed, she would not introduce it. She changed her mind. We got in touch with her, and we said, um, we told her, you know, that this is the voters. You really want to get defeated next time? And she had a problem with some of the language, so we negotiated 
the compromise, and she's introduced it every session since, up until this year. This is the first time since 94 that she has not introduced it, and she isn't answering my phone calls. And I'm concerned about that, but I can understand it because every session we've only had one or two or three representatives that would sign on because we need that we need to have people ask their own representatives to co-sponsor the bill. The, what the bill is asking is that our government commit to being a leader in negotiating a nuclear weapons ban treaty and that we use the money that's saved instead for shutting down and cleaning up the nuclear industries, which includes nuclear weapons industries, include nuclear power plants, because nuclear power plants are making weapons-grade material. And until we get rid of the nuclear power plants, we can never be sure that we can get rid of nuclear weapons. And we don't need them. We don't need them. We've got wind and solar. It's, it's, it's paying for itself now. It's, it's what's good for the economy. You know, Toshiba and Arriva and, and uh, Westinghouse are all going bankrupt, thank God. Isn't that wonderful? And uh, Duke Energy, which is wanting to build new nuclear power plants near uh, 40 miles from my house, uh, is, is backing away from that because they can't get the funding. So we, I think nuclear is dying. However, in the meantime, in 2010, uh, President Obama, after his marvelous speech about a world without nuclear weapons, perhaps not in my lifetime, he added later, uh, and obviously, he really meant that. Um, he, uh, he agreed to a trillion dollar modernization of nuclear weapons in exchange for Congress agreeing to um, the START Treaty with Russia, the new START Treaty. This is a terrible idea. I think you would agree that it's a terrible idea. We don't need to spend a trillion dollars on nuclear weapons. We need to spend a trillion dollars on, ch on completely changing our energy infrastructure and, and providing health care and education. But you know all these things. I'm <laughs> talking to the choir here. Um, so, where am I? Oh, last year, when I went to with Carol Erner to Alliance for Nuclear Account Accountability DC Days. I, have you heard of that? It's a wonderful thing that happens in the spring every year where people get together and, and get a package of information that's a little bit overwhelming from these experts who live on the edges of the nuclear weapons facilities that still haven't been cleaned up. Anyway, I visited Lazy Clay and he read the bill and he said, will this help get rid of the Westlake landfill? And I said, yeah. <laughs> so we signed on. So we need him to sign on again this, this, time, this session. And in fact, we're going to, there's going to be a meeting at his office uh, tomorrow morning uh, to ask him to sign on. I don't think he's going to be there, though. And when I go to Washington, D.C., if he hasn't already signed on, then I'm going to go ask him to again. But there are other representatives in, in the St. Louis area, right? Are there any that think can, that they're capable of, of, of understanding the need to do these things? No. <laughs> and Lacker. Yeah. Oh. Oh. He's, He's the best chance. He's the best chance, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, please give him lots of positive feedback for having signed on last oh, the, year. The guy in Kansas City, Mike, Cleaver. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I, met, I might be meeting with him there. I'm going to be going with uh, Ann Sullentrop of Physicians for Social Responsibility. So um, another thing I wanted to talk about is the Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty. That's, that's the exciting news because uh, for the first time ever, the General Assembly has decided that it doesn't care what the um, Security Council has to say. <laughs> Um, they are going to negotiate a nuclear weapons ban treaty in June. And on June 17th, uh, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, U.S. and International, and Reaching Critical Will, are promoting a um, women's march to ban the bomb in New York City 
to march to the United Nations to show our support for a nuclear weapons ban treaty and to ask the United States to become a party to this rather than boycotting it. June 17th, that's the Saturday before the negotiations begin, which will be June 19th to July 7th. They already met for a week in March for everybody to lay out their uh, positions and their suggestions. And so uh, between March and June, there's a committee that's pulling together a proposed treaty, and then they're going to get together and hash it out. So um, not everybody can go to New York City, so we're hoping that there will be um, marches and rallies and educational experiences all over the country in solidarity on June 17th. And I understand that St. Louis Wolfis is thinking about doing that, so that's great. We'd love to know about it. And one of the things that I do, I love Facebook because it's a wonderful opportunity to, to communicate with one another. Uh, but there's so much stuff on there. You get bombarded by information and it becomes overwhelming. I, since 1998, I've been uh, maintaining a group of, uh, site on Yahoo groups called Nuke News, N-U-C-N-E-W-S, where every day I post articles and links to articles from, about nuclear issues. And now I've created a Nuke News site, N-U-C-N-E-W-S, on Facebook. And that's all you have to look for is Nuke News. And, and like it and follow it. And it's a good way to keep up with what's, and share, you know, send me information if you, get, if you have information. I really would like to have it. Another site that I maintain is the uh, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom U.S section Facebook page, and we want to hear what your branch is doing so that we can share it with the rest of Wilf. <sighs> okay, another thing I wanted to talk about was the um, Radioactive Roads website on Facebook, or Rad Waste uh, is another thing you can look up, and that's about the transportation of uh, highly enriched radioactive liquid waste for the first time ever liquid wa waste is going to be transported on the highways in, in casks from Chalk River Canada to Savannah River site South Carolina everybody is yawning is it me or is it the dinner <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Those are contagious. One person did it. <laughs> I'm trying not to be boring. No, no. <laughs> Somebody's just too sleepy in this me. Yeah. Well, um, so <laughs> it's really important that they not be allowed to do this. It, it's bad enough that they're transporting um, solid radioactive waste on the roadways because if there's an accident, it's going to be a very... Um, annoying for a lot of people because they won't be able to get where they want to go. But it's possible to clean it up. They might have to tear up a section of the highway and rebuild it. But it's possible. But if there's a li liquid that gets spread in an in an accident, and then it gets in the water, and then it gets in the water, it's it's crazy. And they're doing it for sixty five million dollars. That's why they're doing it. There's no need for it. It's just Canada doesn't want the waste. Of course, nobody wants the waste, right? That's why we don't have any place to put it now. Now, my, my friends, my expert friends at Alliance for Nuclear Accountability for years have been saying, what we have to do until we really do figure out the solution is to create hardened on-site storage at most of the sites. Some of the sites are so close to water and so dangerous, like Fukushima, for example. It should never have been there. Uh, that you need to get the waste away from where, whatever the water is where it's likely, likely to get flooded. But otherwise, at the nuclear power plants, when they're shut down, they need to, the waste needs to stay there. We don't need to make more radioactive sites. We need to figure out ways to, uh, until we figure out a solution where they can neutralize it, perhaps 200 years from now or whatever. Um, so. We're asking people to, who live in states, and I don't know if you do in Missouri, but you might have radioactive, liquid radioactive waste going through here, because they're, they're not telling us the routes that they're taking. 
you know, it's through the eastern United States, coming down through Niagara Falls, or coming down around the, the, the Great Lakes, and then down and winding down to you get down through the mountains until you get down to uh, to Aiken, South Carolina, which is on the Savannah River, which is a beautiful river that has been totally destroyed. Another place that's been totally destroyed that I went and interviewed some people at a couple of weeks ago was uh, Irwin, Tennessee, beautiful little mountain valley where there people love to kayak and swim and camp and and for 60 years nuclear fuel services has been dumping plutonium and uranium and other nasty ums into this little river, this whitewater river. And a friend of ours, a fellow Wilf member who lives in Tennessee, um, she in 2010 began collecting samples for 95 river miles downstream. Uh, and at every place they, they tested, they found plutonium and uranium and other nasty things that came, clearly the signature came from, from that plant. And Linda, trooper that she is, they would fill, fill these galvanized pipes full of mud and take it up to the truck and drive it off and ship it off to the labs for testing. And within three years she had melanoma on both forearms and stomach cancer and almost didn't survive. She's okay. She's, she's, Right now she's a cancer survivor and she's still working really hard on it. One of the sites on Facebook is Nuclear Free Future Tour, which is about this trip. And there are three interviews uh, from Tennessee with Linda Modica and her friends about Irwin, Tennessee. And also uh, nearby in Jonesboro is Aerojet where they make depleted uranium weapons and, and the environment around Jonesboro, Tennessee is also very bad. And they've done it all over all over the place, not just in this country, it's all over the world. And people don't know what to do with, about it, and so they turn away from it, and they think, oh, well, you know, what can I do? Who am I? I'm just, well, I'm just a nobody. I'm just a secretary, you know. But I decided to do something about it, and it really does, one person can make a difference if you're creative. Not everybody's going to want to sit in front of the White House for, for 18 years. I mean, I was lucky I found my soulmate, so it made it a lot easier. But what can you do where you are? What can you do? You can raise people's awareness. You can teach people. This little flyer has a bunch of ideas of things that you can do. So read it carefully. And there's links to places that you can go to learn more. In fact, there's a thing that says here, what can we do? Educate ourselves about the proposed nuclear weapons ban treaty at reachingcriticalwill.org and ICANW.org. Uh, these, are, these are wonderful young people who are following everything that happens and reporting on it and, and uh, making sure that everybody knows what's happening. Um, mayors for Peace. Try to get your mayor to become a mayor for peace. Um, let's see. Uh, well, she says support the Nuclear Weapons Abolition and Economic and Energy Conversion Act. Yes, and in, in doing so, you can, one way you can do so is by signing our petition and letting me have it. Make sure that you put your zip code on there because uh, that way we can tell who your representative is and we can let your representative know that you signed it. Um, on the back side of this flyer, and there's more of these over there you can take, you can photocopy them, you can pass them around. The, this is the bill that, as it was last year. It was H.R. 1976 last, last session. It doesn't have a number now because it hasn't been introduced yet. But this is the language that we want the bill to, to have. And so if you like it, help spread the word about it, please. Is there anything else I was going to talk about? Let's see. I'm sorry, this is just the second time I've talked this year, so... And not as smooth as a lot of people might be, but I have a lot that I care about. <laughs> oh, one other thing. Charmaine Whiteface is a Lakota Sioux woman, Defenders of the Black Hills, who lives on the Pine Ridge Reservation 
and she and her young friends have been um, working for a uranium uh, mining moratorium and cleanup act. Uh, Representative Raul Grijalva of Arizona for a couple of years has said that he would introduce the bill, but it's never been introduced. But you should check into that. The, the uranium mines, that there, there are hundreds of uranium mines all, all over the country, but particularly out west, that were just abandoned um, to blow around in the wind. Uh, I, I, I went in 2009 through Moab, Utah, where they were just beginning to clean up a mine that had been left on the edge of the river for, for decades before they started cleaning it up. And while I was there, there was a windstorm, and you could see all that stuff going in the water. And, and out west, of course, there's hardly any water, so everybody's getting exposed to it. So that is another thing that you can help with, is, is the Uranium Mining Moratorium and Cleanup Act. And um, I think I'll just open it up for questions now. Okay. <laughs> um, you said in Tennessee where the rivers were um, polluted with uranium and um, all the other things, it was Jonesboro and Irwin or Irwin? Irwin. No, E-R-W-I-N. Okay. Yeah, and if you go to NFF tour on Facebook or Nuclear Free Future tour, there's interviews there of Linda Modica and her friends and some pictures. There's also pictures of the uh, Wolf Table here in St. Louis. <laughs> you're in, you're up there. Yes. Somewhere over there. No meal. Um, interesting debate about um, uh, spent plutonium fuel and, and different kinds of waste. And it's interesting that you know you. You endorse the idea of like basically maintaining on-site storage at every nuclear facility, and the backstory on that um, I understand too. In that, like the facility itself and the and the and, and the enclosure core is basically a permanent nuclear, you know, radioactive monument for the next quarter million years, and so that's going to be there. It has to be protected. So the logic is, why not stick it there? And there's a debate about that because that, you know, that also, you know, has downsides. So, what about this difficulty of transporting the stuff to central facilities? There's, they were talking about a, uh, a burial site in Nevada years ago, and Yuck. still are. And 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 I want to hear more about where that debate has gone because I'm a little behind the curve. It is a serious issue. You know, there are also reasons to to locate, you know, move as much as possible to a, a manageable location. During Obama's administration, he did the he he was asking about the transportation of the, or, or, or the. If it, is there anybody who didn't hear what he said? Okay. Um, during the Obama administration, there was something called the Blue Ribbon Commission on. Um, what to do with the nuclear waste, and not exactly those words, but um, they took testimonies all over the country and they pretended to be interested in what the citizens had to say, but they ended up saying that they thought that there should be interim storage sites established around the country. And fortunately, that hasn't been done yet. Um, Yucca Mountain sounds like a great idea, except that they have earthquakes in the desert around there all the time, weekly or more often than that. And uh, there's an aquifer that that feeds water to several states that's under that area, and it just doesn't make sense to do that. I think we should use Yucca Mountain as a seed repository. It's nice and dry, and mm -hmm. I think it, and it'd be safe there. And it's already built. There's no reason why we shouldn't use it, but just use it for some good instead of something bad. That's what we should do with everything, right? Just just transform our economy to to something that's healthy. Did that answer your question? 
No, but that's a longer answer than um, you know, would take. We'd be here till, till Thursday. Okay. <laughs> you can probably ask a longer question, <coughs> too, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to come here, and um, I appreciate your listening, and I wanted to show some stuff, but my computer just wasn't behaving itself. Yes? I, I was just able to formulate my question, and it's complicated in my mind, and I, I may not be able to make it understood. Uh, but as simple as I can, I can say it, has anyone, or is there any in existence, uh, a, a study of the effect of thermonuclear heat uh, in the modern world as compared to thermonuclear heat, say, a million years ago? Good question. How would you and, do that? And, well, mm -hmm. well that's, that's a tough thing, but it can be done. Uh, I, I'm neither a nuclear scientist or a, a, a physicist. I'm a stupid organic chemist. Uh, but what I'm getting at is I have never heard a comment about the effect of thermonuclear heat, which is just goes out there. Yeah. I mean, it goes through all, all of its uh, stuff, all of its uh, processes, and goes out into the world. And I've never seen a study of the potential for uh, the effect of nuclear heat on climate. It's a good question. I'm worried more about the climate than nuclear. Yeah. And to clarify, you're talking about heat generated in a core that is basically cycled out by a liquid cooling. Yes. And then has, has to be disposed of. So you have thermal effects and outflows. Because right, right. I actually did a big project in Washington decades ago, uh, you know, looking at um, the thermal and hydrologic impacts and uh, well they what they did I have told Ellen the story but we found Can out I come up here and take the microphone so everybody can hear well, he's, he's, yeah, I can hear I'll, I'll, I'll stand over here and talk loud but uh, it here. But the, the short story was uh, um, they were falsifying attempt, their attempts to uh, this was Washington public power supply system and, I was in uh, Western Washington. I was with the Crafts All Alliance, late '70s. Scotty Addison was his name. Hi. <laughs> um, and uh, the short story is is that uh, they wanted to change their wastewater permit, the NPDES permit, to um, liberalize the standards for low flow operation and change the standards for zinc and copper and a bunch of other things in the effluent. And they wanted to use a submerged multi-port diffuser in the Chehalis River to dilute, and then you had to test over there. You couldn't test it in the pipe. All of this was, was creaky, and um, Dixie Lee Ray was then governor of, of the state of Washington. She came out of the Atomic Energy Commission, so she was going to be a problem, and, and her hacks in the agencies. Only the, fish, the fisheries and game department and uh, a few people in the state government raised a stink, and I mean, we came in from outside, and, and these hearings ended up. Well, we showed that they had falsified the flow model of the Chehalis River, because the whole whole thing depended on being able to dilute the the, the thermal and and metals, yeah. you know, in the effluent, and um, they didn't look very closely at the thermal effects. It was kind of presumed that. That intense heat with with warm water cycling out of the out of the cooling system, and then it's kind of a heat exchange thing. You can dilute out the effect of a poisonous chemical theoretically. You know, well, I mean, actually, you can. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but you cannot dilute out the overall effect of heat because it doesn't destroy itself. Right. And, and, and where that came to bear was that by falsifying the flow model, it turned out they'd thrown out data from periods of low rainfall in the historic record, such that their model was skewed to show a, a beautifully uh, heavy flowing river with, without, without much variation. And on that premise, the stuff would dilute and, 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 uh, and disperse along with the heat. 
but what the reality is periodically there are time, there are flow reversals and tidal effects in the river. Salmon would be affected. So not only the concentrations of, of metals in those in those pools, but also heat would pile up. They never yeah, they never looked you're right, they never looked at that. They've that was, been, they've, there have been studies of uh, uh, mechanical and waterfall dams that produce uh, 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 electricity mm -hmm. and heat up the water. Right. And the uh, uh, living material downstream from that is affected in every one of them. Right. And if you imagine the, the huge uh, uh, electric plant that they built in China, that, that it, I think it's just coming online. If you imagine what that could do to a de degree or two, heating of the water that goes through the system. Uh, it's it's killed all kinds of fish. It's killed all they, kinds they, of they, micro. I, I, I can guarantee we look we were raised that issue about the temperature effects in certain you know incidental conditions, but we didn't have any notion of looking at the cumulative effects in the overall. You know, well, it's been, it, it's been shown to be big, and all I was, all I'm interested in, is, is there a thermonuclear effect on the climate? I'm against thermo using thermo uh, nuclear energy, and I, I'm 78 years old, and I've just come upon that that opinion in the last two years because of reading this, that, and the other thing, and understanding thermonuclear chemistry a little better. Right. And uh, I, I'm starting to become a little worried about it because nobody has really looked at it. I've not seen any information on any possibility of that being in effect. And if we build more and more of these things... My philosophy is... My philosophy is, if you see something needs to be done and nobody's doing it, it's your job. Uh, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, I've been looking for one. <laughs> we, we also used to quip about the, the paradox of uh, generating temperatures akin to the temperature of the sun to boil water. And this is part of, you, this is part of what you're talking about because, you know, the, the primary thermonuclear reaction is incredibly hot. Unlike, unlike burning stuff to a, several hundred degrees to boil water, you're talking, you know, I, I don't remember the numbers. But it goes, that's through, a whole it goes out to the cooling tower. It's a, it's a whole different order of magnitude in terms of the temperatures you're generating to boil water. I think we need it's to. Time us, it's time for us to say goodbye. Thank you so much. Give a big hand to Ellen. Yeah.